Let every voice Let every voice and sing till I then have ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the blazing skies. Let it resound. Faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of a new day, be good. Let us march on. We gotta keep on marching, yeah Ooh. Until we find our victory Ooh. Yeah Ooh. I know you've been hurting Ooh. And I know you've been struggling Ooh. But you gotta hold on Ooh. Keep on marching I know you've been waiting And you've been pressing But you gotta keep moving Yes, keep on moving Let us march on Amazing grace Let us march on You can't help but listen to that and get the tingle in your spine as you see the forecasting of justice played out in our country. Today, we come together to gather around the table of justice to examine how our ancestors, the freedom fighters, the revolutionaries have led us to a moment, an inflection point to consider where we've been, where we are, and propose where we might go. Welcome to our Juneteenth celebration here. And as we consider this eve of the liberation of Black people, we look at the state's map and recognize that 47 states recognize this celebration. And we also want to recognize the incredible work of Representative Sheila Jackson Lee, who among many are leading the fight so that Juneteenth can be recognized as a national holiday, but also positioned in our history correctly. I'm Antonio Saunders and I serve as the Vice President of Program and Diversity here at Teach for America, and I'm glad to be your host. Welcome. As we think about the Juneteenth celebration on the backdrop of police brutality, we take a moment of silence for the institutional racism, the white supremacy that keeps us from all being free, that has stolen too many lives and the recent lives of Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, George Floyd, 
And this past weekend in Atlanta, where I live, Rashard Brooks, may we all pause to recognize their life, to say their names, and to really center on this moment. Thank you for that. You've been at Institute and you have been working hard, not only to learn about what it means to step inside of a classroom with your kids and your com respective communities this fall, but you've also been learning about a history, a history and a plight for people in this country that was not given, it had to be demanded. We've come today to continue that celebration and if you're like me, a person of color, a black man in this country, I'm holding somewhat of the devastation, the fury and the rage that we are still here. But as Jesse Williams told us during your opening, I will not be discouraged, I will not be dismayed until justice has fully come. Core members, institute staff, I welcome you into this space and I appreciate the hard work that you've committed to on behalf of our communities, on behalf of Teach for America, and collectively on behalf of our freedom. I was about 22 when I realized what this day meant. I was walking on campus at the University of Alabama, trying to get my bearings as a first generation college student. Somebody asked me, Antonio, are you gonna celebrate Juneteenth tomorrow? And I'm like, y'all, I don't, I don't know what that is, but I'm always down for a celebration, bruh. And so he goes on to explain that Juneteenth is the celebration and the liberation of black folks. But in my predominantly white classrooms and my schoolings, I thought that when President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, I think in about 1863, that the slaves were free. But we understand now that the, when states left the Union and joined the Confederacy during the Civil War, many of them rebelled against this proclamation. That in fact, it took another two years of this news being enacted across various states like Texas for this to come to become a realization in the fabric of our country. When the Civil War ended in 1865, and two months later on June 19, there was a major, Major General Gordon Granger of the United of the Union Army issued an order in Gavison, Texas. And this is what he declared. The people of Texas are informed that in accordance with the proclamation of the executive of the United States, all slaves were free. And what that set into motion is a recognition of what we call and what we see today as June 5th. And this year, 2020 marks the 155th anniversary of this celebration, of this jubilee, of our collective right, our pressing, our march towards freedom. You may be thinking, hey, I knew that, or, I'm just finding out. And I wanna invite in this space the reality of a fractured history that can often leave us without a true understanding of where we've been to honor where we are. So today, what we're positioning is Black history is American history. I know you all are a lively bunch. People have been telling me about you, all your amazing strengths and your talents. And so to get the chat going, I would like for you all to put in, when was the first time you heard about Juneteenth? What was that moment? How did you come into the realization about perhaps what you had been taught versus what someone was introducing to you about Black history in our country? Appreciate you all for doing that. I also want to recognize that this year in particular, our Black staff alongside Alisa, our CEO and the management team and our executives at Teach for America 
are making an even deeper commitment to the work that we need to do as an organization in our classrooms and our network and even here on staff. Starting this year and moving forward, we will recognize Juneteenth as a holiday. So tomorrow, all of our folks, including you, we will be off so that we may actually join in with an understanding, with an awareness, with a protest in our, in our heart and in our soul that justice is our right, but we still have a long ways to go. The fire that we bring to Teach for America is that every time we see a school building, children walking into those buildings and they cannot live out their true potential in a way that is authentic to their dreams and their desires, we show up alongside their parents, their village and their community to ensure that the forces that would counter the trajectories of our students have to bow to the weight of the response that we give. We call that work education freedom fighters. And we stand in the history on the shoulders, as I mentioned earlier at the top of this, of folks who've been doing it before. Check this out. When you look at how Black folks were considered in this country, that they were property, and then they were enslaved, that it was illegal to read. But our ancestors defied this system by sneaking, risking, and at times being lynched for going underneath the trees and huddling together to read. And we even see that after the Juneteenth celebration that set into motion the Freedom Schools, some of the earliest in Richmond around 1865. And now we even see today that students and folks like you demanding that we really become conscious and present to the conditions that keep all of us from collectively saying that we are truly equal under the law, in our economics, in our workplaces, and in our schoolhouses. Today's panel is going to actually help us think more broadly, more deeply, but more precisely around how we do this work in this present moment. You know what I like about this moment? Let me tell you what I like about this moment. There are many people who, many companies you've probably seen that are putting out their messages around, I stand with black lives, I stand against police brutality. And that's cool to a point, but we have to say that there's a difference between calling out injustice and fighting for injustice. And we have to remember that fighting for injustice is a commitment often to saying in the moments and in the inflection points where we don't have scripts, we don't have strategies, you better know how to step in and alongside your community, your students, your teachers, and people who've been doing the work with receipts to get things done. Any leader who has the time to plan for something can orchestrate success. But the real test of anyone is where do you stand when you don't have a plan, but you have a moment to act with courage? Well, that's where we are. So what exactly are we going to do? We have panelists today that have come to advise us, give, them, give us the wisdom, give us the practices to reposition us in this moment to say, we're gonna seize this moment. We're not gonna waste it. Let me introduce those people to you now. First up is a brilliant young lady that I have come to know on staff because of her local work in the community. Kiana Dabashi is not only a colleague, she's one who I look to to actually say, how do you do this work as a mother? How do you do this work on the PTA? How do you do this work not asking for permission but demanding that the voices that are proximate to the lived experiences, they get the resourcing, the elevation that they need each and every single day. Kiana, thank you for being here. 
Next up is Jasmine Johnson, someone who I just met but already admire. She's a Teach for America alum, and she finds her work positioning schools, school leaders, and an entire building around. How do you show up for kids, not just with a snazzy mission on the wall, but how do you actually translate that mission into the interactions, into the pedagogical practices, and into the ways that you help children see themselves, dream about who they can be, and then resource them to get there. Welcome to the panel, Jasmine. And then my brother, Mario Joven Shaw, who has been leading the work alongside not only his community, but also connecting brothers across our network and across our nation on the fundamental principle that we see playing out your blackness, your brownness, you, a black man. You are relevant, you are bold, you are here, and we stand with you. Thank you, Mario, for the work that you have been doing. Without further ado, core members and Teach for America staff, help me welcome this incredible group of folks to our panel today. Hey, hey, hey. Thank you, How's it going? How y'all doing? Yes, it was great. <laughs> awesome. Okay, yeah, thank you for that. Yes. Yeah, awesome. Thank you all for being here with us today and for taking time out of what is a moment for us. I think mm -hmm. you can underestimate what it means to show up in your blackness in this moment mm -hmm. where you're both dealing with the injustices that are so deeply connected to both your humanity and your work. Mm -hmm. Amid all of the things that we know, we also have to deal with COVID, mm -hmm. you know, the financial cal calamities in our community. And then we show up fighting um, for our people each and every single day. And I don't wanna diminish that, the load that you all are actually carrying in this moment. Thank you for, um, coming to share your wisdom, your expertise, your knowledge with all of us today. I'll kick this off with a foundational question that I would say that I ask myself all the time. I know that you all sort of base your work within this question and that our core members in and of themselves are beginning to formulate thoughts, practice, um, and ideas around what is a culturally responsive classroom? And why is it important to the development of, get this, all kids? Hmm. Not some kids, but all kids. I will kick it to you, Jasmine, if you don't mind starting. Oh, of course. Um, when I read that question, the first person that came to mind was Rita Pearson, um, her video. She has a line that says, kids don't learn from people they don't like. And I thought like that is um, so true, right? Like before we can think about teaching a curriculum or the sciences, we have to get to know who are we in front of. And every community is different. The context is different and every individual story is different as well. So culturally responsive like teaching is not only about race, right? It's getting to know unique communities, their needs, their assets, not focusing on deficits, getting to know families, their current circumstances, their wishes, like their hopes and dreams for their children, and really building a classroom community where everyone is like acknowledges and sees each other, right? I like culture responsive, responsive classrooms is, was at the center of my classroom as an educator, is at the center of my school. We must get to know the people we are in front of, and kids need to get to know each other, right? Um, as an educator, my students knew, like, hey, I'm in this class, I'm working not just for my own benefit. I may want to be a doctor, but I also know that my peer sitting next to me wants to be a lawyer so that she can help her family. So when I show up in this room, I'm going to participate not only for my own benefit, but for hers as well. And it just builds community. Culture responsive teaching is just as much about community as it is the individual as well. Yeah, there's something in there that resonates with me deeply um, that I believe Kiana does very, very well. Kiana, how do you acknowledge and see kids through a classroom? How do, how do we take that on in a very genuine, consistent, disciplined way? I think part of it, when I think about even culturally responsive teaching, and that's, that's my baby in the background, sorry, y'all. 
and wrap about culture of responsive teaching. I don't even think that that's antiquated to like what our times are calling for and what really what we need to think about is how we start to decolonize our classrooms and decolonize the educational system. And so when I think about culturally responsive teaching, prior to we would think about like how to validate, how to make sure kids are seen, but we were thinking about it from more of an assimilation standpoint. And now what we really need to start thinking about is how we like start to confront and start to question power structures within our education system, including our classrooms and thinking about who is in control, who has knowledge and what is that role and how they got the knowledge and what maintains those positions of power. So I think when I when I think about like our students, I think about validating their time, their, their talent, their expertise, their leadership, and, and recognizing that there's nothing about them that needs to be fixed, right? Like we're not the saviors in their lives. We're not coming to do anything to move them from their communities. And I think the decolonization of our own mindset around how we see our, our kids as deficit-based or like people that need fixing and saving um, from whatever circumstances we've like created, these narratives that we've created in our mind. I think that that's how I've always approached it from like liberation, not just being for like adults, but like kids liberating us too um, from the antiquated ways that we even think about um, schooling and, and the ways that we even, that we even see um, children like they're brilliant I, I know so like my seven-year-old schools me on the regular so I'm um, just recognizing that, that there's so much that we have to learn from them that they're not blank slates that we come in and write upon um so often you say you come you know come to teach but you, you should be learning so yeah absolutely yeah you, you teach us that you know the transformation is not one directional it's bi-directional you know the first student is the teacher to the experiences of that community of those kids and amplifying who they are jovian how do we do that how do how do we recognize the importance of a culturally responsive classroom live into the spirit of what keon is talking about decolonizing it and it can be like this charged uh word uh but it's really about saying that we're going to center this classroom on the experiences of the lived uh, knowings, the lived um, cultures, the traditions, the values of the students, and not override that with curriculums, not override that with policies, right? How do you see this happening and how do you support the realization of it? Yeah, I, 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 uh, that's excellent. You know, I love Kiana. I could listen to her all day. <laughs> Jasmine, same. I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing um, already. And I think for us um, in Profound Genome, we talk about what does it mean to own your story? And we, we first start off asking who you are and how do you want to lead in our organization? And the reason why we do that is because you cannot liberate a child until you liberate yourself. And that's something that Keanu was kind of like talking about. Um, and so often we run into, um, in my work more specifically, males of color who have never been able to tell their story in an authentic format in front of other male um, teachers of color more specifically. And it's amazing for them to be able to liberate and own their story and own their message. And so if we're going to be able to listen to kids and if we're going to hear from them um, and own their stories, we have to know what it feels like for us to be heard as well. Um, and, and oftentimes the same thing we're asked and required to do for kids is not being done for adults, more specifically black teachers um, in, in buildings where they experience harm and being asked to, to be culturally relevant. So you have to create a culturally relevant uh, uh, staff <laughs> um, before you can even create a culturally re relevant classroom. And the principal must or school leaders must think about the practices that they have within their school building um, that impact the way that people including adults show up and the way that parents show up and teachers show up before you can even get to kids. Um, and, and you don't want to cause harm to kids uh, if you're not really speaking to adults right now. So that's my biggest, my biggest piece right now is really thinking about how do we tell and own our stories and liberating males of color to be able to do that. Jovan, thank you for that. It's, it's a reminder you all that these words are not fads or taglines to just put on walls or say that I do this with my kid, my students or my, or my kids. It's really about the self-examination of who am I mm. and a commitment to say, okay. I am always going under and scrutinizing how I examine my, my own self so that I can actually show up and understand that process for someone else. 
let's switch gears a bit and, and sort of continue this with the next question here, which is Juneteenth is about the announcement of liberation of our enslaved ancestors. How do we make classrooms places of liberation? How do we do that work? Go ahead, Kiana. Okay. Well, I think that the first thing that we think about when we think about classrooms, we think about folk laws. And so I think that for teachers, it's important to recognize that, like, you don't need a checklist of things that you should be doing or, or systems that you should be creating. The first system you should be thinking about dismantling is yourself. And so a lot of that work and making sure that our classrooms are liberated is doing that self-reflection and doing that self-work because our experiences and our backgrounds we bring into those spaces and often the impression that our, that our students feel is because of what is being done to them. And so when I tell my teachers to start thinking about like your mindsets, unpacking your biases, thinking about those stereotypes and those messages that you've gotten from the media and unpacking those so that they don't live in your system, so that you can interrupt the school discipline um, and confinement pipelines. You can think about why you're referring, why we're um, moving speeds or why we're, you know, like our, our black students are overrepresented in our suspension and our data. Uh, think about all of the things that you are implementing that are pushing our students out um, I think that's how we make our classrooms more liberated. Like stop the over-policing of black and brown bodies within those four walls and within our schools. And when we can think about our students as uh, joyful humans who deserve to thrive, I think that's the first step towards making sure that like all of our students get the quality education that they deserve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, no, yeah, so I was thinking about this as well, like from classroom places of liberation. It's kind of like, again, going back to who you are as a person. When you know yourself, you're not offended by how someone else shows up, you know, unless it's producing harm uh, towards you, right? And so oftentimes, us as adults, we're not given space for us to be and own who we are as people. So we're not able to allow students to show up. We don't even sometimes know what liberation even feels like for us, mm -hmm. for us to even know what a classroom should feel like. So I'm thinking about how we're saying how all Black Lives Matter in 2020, finally, you know what I mean? <laughs> that we're recognizing that, incorporating that into the movement, how Black trans women are now, uh, in an entire trans community is now being included into the conversation. That was not the case five years ago. And I think um, one of the things I was just talking to my staff about uh, that I love about Michelle and Barack Obama, I watch Becoming all the time because I just love um, some of, I just find every little time I watch it, it's like a quote that I'm, that I'm uh, grabbing from her. Um, and it's just amazing. But one of the things that I'm, that I'm learning from uh, Michelle and Barack Obama is they gave us an opportunity for us to own who we are as people. That, uh, uh, that we could be who we want to be in our skin and that is black, right? And I think that we didn't, I, at least for me, um, being uh, 30 going on 31 years old, um, in two days, um, <laughs> yeah, black don't crack, but like me, <laughs> who I am, I just think that I didn't experience that five years ago, like, and, I, and I'm, and it's real serious, like uh, five years ago, I wasn't um, publicly out five years ago, and by, or what I like to call people, what I like to say, inviting people into my life. Um, five years ago and now in 2020 um, that begins to be like a part of my a platform to be able to speak out to be able to say that that was not happening you know what I mean in the movement 2015 2016 so we're starting to see that but we're more importantly starting to see adults being able to liberate themselves and I think it's by us having these communities um, teach for America with the collective group and we're able to just show up and be ourselves I love how everybody dressed and just fashionably just amazing <laughs> in that space um and that's just awesome you know that we get to do that and once we start to do that and understand what we are asking for kids we need to also do for adults we'll be able to get to a classroom that is liberated that's that's very helpful mm -hmm. yeah. i love the focus on self and in, uh, the only thing i would add is that internalized oppression is real right like this is going to be mm -hmm. uncomfortable yeah Right. Like you, there are times when you might feel ashamed of decisions that you've made in your class. But what's important is that we recognize when we've made mistakes, we recognize when we are perpetuating these inequalities, these um, oppressive systems, and that we make an like, uh, effort to change it. And we can't do this work alone, which is why I think the core member community is can be very powerful if we show up in these DEI spaces and in our cohort spaces authentically ourselves and really being honest about where we are and what we need to move forward. Yes, yeah, good. And, and let's just be honest about something. Uh, we didn't grow up with the vernacular or 
the trainings, even with our teachers dubbing this as culturally responsive pedagogy. Mm -hmm. um, so we can't sort of sit back here and say, oh, this is just something that you do. Everybody has to get into a practice around this. How does a first year teacher, how do you as a first year teacher, you're learning, you are in relationship with your kids, you're trying to understand what systems are right, what systems are harmful. How do you get acquainted with the education system so you can really live out culturally responsive teaching even in your first year? Now, I, wanna, I wanna sort of think about this through a race-based lens. What does this mean for people of color and non-people of color? I love that. I'm going to build off of what Jasmine said because there is something about this toxic woke culture that we have that makes folks mm -hmm. feel like they've arrived and it doesn't allow space for, for people to engage and to grow. And so really what I think for our folks who don't identify as by TLC, um, to really think about then, then how do I start somewhere? Like just starting is the hard part um, and making space for yourself between like being an ally all the way to like, you know, that to yeah. being a co-conspirator but but i think that like as, as a person of color as a black woman and, and I'm sure my other folks who identify that same way we have to we have to let let folks in we have to think about like how do we create a culture where people are allowed to make mistakes people are, are allowed to like fall and fail at this thing called a dei journey and you know, like what it means to be more inclusive and um and equitable in our classrooms because you won't always get it right we don't always get it right and i think mm -hmm. that we think about like our skin making you know like as um, you know, like less acceptable to making um, and choices that are oppressive in our in our classrooms. But like, even we we do that to one another. All skin folk mm -hmm. and kin folk, and that just means that like that internalized oppression shows up in your classroom. So like, just recognizing like there is no arrival point. Like we all should be on this journey together and make a space for one another. So like this cancel culture, um, this toxic woke culture, really is har harmful for our kids. And so like once we can just try to think about how we start to dismantle our own egos, right? And like decenter yeah. ourselves in this work and make it more about the community. I think we can make choices that will be for the liberation of all folks. All of our liberation is inextricably tied and bound together. And that includes white people because they make this system. So we need them. Yeah. That's real. Well, I, yeah, that's, that, that's good. I think about how COVID wasn't the great equalizer, but it did remind us how everyone is connected. It reminded that when I get sick, you get sick. And we have to think about that from a mental standpoint as well, right? Like that when I'm messed up in the head, you know what I mean? In, in terms of the fact that I'm not thinking right, in terms of, of, of respecting people and allowing people to show up the way that they want to, then here comes other people starting to do that same exact thing. So when I think about where we're at today, I think that we are all connected. And for people of color, for non-people of color, um, the, the you know COVID though yeah, the, the numbers are disproportionate, it definitely still does attack everyone, and racism does the exact same thing. Um, and we could continue to perpetuate those things when we don't choose to show up as individuals and as people. Um, I do uh, understand how there are systems in place that's putting us in in these situations, um, and we got to acknowledge them, but we also have to recognize when we are a part of continuing and perpetuating that and be willing to say, I'm sorry, and making those mistakes. I made tons of mistakes um, in, in my first year and I apologize to students. Be willing to apologize. Be willing to say, I'm sorry. Like That goes a long way with students. That does not make you weak um, by saying, you know what? I apologize. The one student I had to do my biggest apology to, him and I are still close still to this day. He's in his second year in college and him and I are like super close. He's the reason why I started Profound Gentleman because I recognize the mistakes I was making with him. And yeah, I mean, even in my own experience, just real quickly, like I literally like thought that the kid was, was because of how everybody else viewed him previously before, I thought that he was going to be a bad kid because that's how he was in sixth grade. So him coming to my classroom, listening to what all the other teachers were saying about him, I literally taught him based on what adults were saying, based on their perceived mindset, based on maybe them not even creating a strong relationship with them. That boy got an A in my classroom every single quarter. You know what I mean? It's just crazy. And he loved reading. But if I would have listened to what other people were saying, which I did in the beginning, 
I wouldn't have been able to reach him. So again, there are like what Kiana said, we could do it too. <laughs> we we could make those mistakes. And when I apologized to him, we were like this, like the whole time. It was amazing. Javon, you remind me that part of creating a classroom space that is a place of liberation means creating systems and structures for our students to question and name mm. the problem, when, even when it's uncomfortable, especially when it's uncomfortable. And for most core members, we are going into communities that we are, you know, you're not a part of, right? A, a lot of folks are moving first time in this particular city with these kids. You don't know the context. Our students, in this case, know much more than we do. Give them the space to like name, like, hey, that didn't feel right for me. Wow. They, might, they may not have the language, the academic language that we have to describe it, but they are intuitive and as young as four and five. They can name what they like, what they don't like, right? And what it is that you are doing wrong. Mm -hmm. and this conversation, you know, prompts us to say the rules and the policies in your classroom are not just for students, they're for you as well. Mm -hmm. That yeah. a teacher and a student is in a relationship and the foundation of any relationship is two people learning how to meet each other's needs. That means you gotta come out of title, you gotta come out of position, and you gotta be transparent and real around where you are, the work that you're doing, and how you want your students to hold you accountable, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. To continue in mm. your path. Y'all really, really <laughs> doing it today. You're doing it. Let's talk about this. We speak a lot around sort of like combating racism and the current moment that we're in specifically around anti-blackness. But let's get the language right. What is anti-blackness and how does it play out in schools and in classrooms? And most importantly, how do you combat it? Antonio, one of the most common um, ways I've seen anti-blackness show up in our schools, especially in schools that are that serve black and brown students um, it's through low expectations. When we come in with assumptions around what our students can do, what our families can do, um, assumptions about their lifestyle and like what they have without getting to know again, those individual narratives. And I've seen it where folks come in with the savior complex like Kiana mm -hmm. named, right? So the intention might be to help or befriend um, someone who's just doing TikTok videos is not, um, it, it's not it, right? Like our kids not knowing how to read is anti-Black, right? Our job is to educate them or to give them the tools that they need to do whatever it is that they wanna be in life. So we should be making sure that they know how to read, that they have access, ongoing access to the sciences as well. So holding high expectations and making sure that our students are accessing the content that they need based on the grade level that they're at, that is how we like really, truly get to a form of liberation and freedom. Yeah. You know, I'm going back to storytelling. Anti-blackness is not giving, and, and me being an English teacher, anti-blackness is not giving kids the opportunity to see themselves within books and, and live stories, you know what I mean? Uh, teachers that are in front of them. I find oftentimes that you go into a school building in a library and you, not, you don't even see not one book. Or if you do see books about black people, it's about uh, just slavery. Like, you know, and it's not a variety. So I think anti-blackness is painting this narrative of this is who you have to be. Oftentimes we look at systems, but sometimes anti-blackness could come in this, and, and people putting us in a box and telling us that we have to be these particular type of people and individuals and only providing us with books and materials. You know, they've done that before in previous history, uh, uh, mm -hmm. in previous history, and we have to combat that as well. I think that to me, storytelling is the most beautiful thing that we could do um you know in terms of being able it, it's to me a form and it is a form of of a fight in this movement um and so one of the easiest things that, that that we could do in our classrooms is to provide more books and materials where kids could see themselves in various situations um we talked about one of my uh, one of the staff members talked about how they were trying to teach their kids how to skateboard and, and the kid, like, he was like, I never skateboard because I, you know, grew up and I didn't know, you know what I mean? Um, how that black people could skateboard. And that was the thing. And when he took his kid to the skateboard park, he was the only black kid in the skateboard park. And what did that mean for him? So he had to be able to expose his kids to like, there is a black culture of skateboarders, you know what I mean? So like part of anti-blackness is the narrative that we actually tell about who we are as people 
and what society also tells us. So everybody could be a part of being anti black. You could be black and be anti black by telling people this is who you got to be. Mm-hmm. That's good. I think the only thing that I would add when we think about like our school buildings, I think about like our kids having both the, the mirrors and the windows. Yeah. I even think about like the, a lot of the work we do with the profound ladies and profound gentlemen is really helping to diversify our education force, right? So the way that I see anti-blackness show up in our school buildings is like what was reflected back to our kids. If you're a cafeteria staff, if you're janitorial staff, and and those and not that those are jobs that are not needed, but that's the only time mm-hmm. the kids see black people. That's mm-hmm. anti-blackness when like we don't have teachers who look like our kids leading classrooms. We don't have teachers who educators and, and principals who look like our kids leading schools. They start to learn like what their ceiling is that's anti-blackness so i think about how we like to mario push your question every single structure yes in the imagery and the books but we should also think about reflection and, it, and this is for our administrators but this is also for commerce coming in we start to think about like what things we should be questioning and we can start to think from the top down from the district level down like what is the diversity policy and like what is the inclusion policy um for or like the, the way that we're thinking about making our, our spaces more diverse so that our kids can actually see them and they don't see just like what other people have as far as expectations. And again, that's not for me to dismiss the folks who play an integral role in our schools operating because those jobs are also very important, but it's a both mm-hmm. end. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's such, a, it's such a good point, Kiana, to sort of build up where Jasmine sort of started us at in terms of expectation settings and the stories we have to tell. But I really love this point as a form of combating anti-rape, um, anti-blackness, which is windows and mirrors. Mm. Do you know what it is to see yourself Mm. that often reflected in society as a kid who is telling, the world is telling them what they can't be and for you to ensure that that child holds on to the value of who they are and the windows so that they can actually understand that the very nature of our souls is to be unlimited to be expansive and abundant in the faces of everything that we have to endure, but to also remove the obstacles so our kids can actually peek beyond the horizon to see their future. Let's go here. Why do you, what, what do you see as the primary role of the teacher advocate? See, but you got me stuck on this soul part, though. <laughs> like, I'm still <laughs> like that right there. Like, soul's unlimited. <laughs> we go really, we, we can't just skip that because that soul's unlimited piece. That pushed me right now in this movement, though. Like, in this movement that we're in and that we're seeing, you know, oftentimes people are trying to limit our capabilities where we could go. The, I, you know, yeah, this is for Teach for America and Commerce, but that just hit me. And I just got to acknowledge that, my brother. Like, that just opened me up about, like, souls being unlimited and how we could just continue to just give ourselves, you know what I mean, and show up unapologetically. That's what that just meant to me. That gives me strength for tomorrow to celebrate Juneteenth unlimited souls unlimited that's the theme for my, for my <laughs> unlimited soldiers. Wait, unlimited. Oh, unlimited. wait isn't that a group unlimited soldiers i might be showing my age but but i think mario you like you kind of answering antonio's question then because a lot of it is just like your role as a, a teacher advocate is to get out of the way don't mm. create the barriers don't bring that into so that our souls can be unlimited because a lot of the barriers like people it, it, people bring that stuff in that junk in right like we are perfectly and wonderfully made if, if nobody just touched us or left us alone or created these challenges and and these real and perceived barriers and so like in order for our souls to thrive and our kids souls to thrive this your role is to get out of the way and make space make room for joy um and for joy to abound authentically I know we have some core members, Antonio, I know you have other questions you need to ask. We have core members that are not working in black communities, right? So I'm like, I'm curious about um, what anti-blackness means in that particular scenario, right? Like how can we set up our core members to be allies in this work when they're going into communities where they might not be familiar with other black folks, right? It's such a yeah, good and point. I've done some work, some work like that with our, um, our South Dakota region with um, one of my friends who's on staff, Anna Amor. And our South Dakota region, um, we had a Dakota and Dakota, and that, um, like that, that the, the, uh, the reservation, the Rosebud, and the Pine Ridge Reservation. And those students, I don't remember seeing too many Black students, but I think having the discussion around what Blackness means 
and that mm-hmm. particular community is how we combat anti-blackness. So I think that you don't necessarily have to see black bodies to discuss like black history. First of all, it's a part of all history. And I think acknowledging that is one, one of the ways that I have seen it been, be done really well in a community that we're, you know, it's not necessarily reflected. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think it's also in the way that we talk about the history, right? Like, are we talking about the oppressive systems only that folks uh, of color, black folks in particular, have gone through? Or are we talking about the resilience and the resistance and the beauty that our people have had for so many generations? For like, we're 155 years out, right? What are we framing black history in this way that is like anti and asset based and honors the work that folks have been doing um, since we got here? Yeah. Let's think about this, you all, as the final culminating question here. And um, Jovan, I really appreciate you sort of landing that. That was such like a, a classroom moment where you're like driving your instruction and the student was like, whoa, either I don't understand or I really want to understand what this yeah. is. Where you can actually flow with the people around you. It's, it's so good to sort of perhaps know where you're going, but to be able to respond to the people. So I appreciate you. Um, holding space for that. We're in the midst of, you know, a global pandemic. Mm-hmm. Every day on the news, you don't know what you're going to get. Mm-hmm. And now we see global, a global social justice movement emerging right before our very eyes. Mm-hmm. As we sit on this precipice between today and tomorrow, we're on the eve of Juneteenth. How do you make room for joy? Now that's my word right there. <laughs> I'm wearing my black boy joy pen right now too. Um, <laughs> I wear it all the time. I think um, joy has nothing to do with oftentimes like external, like joy is so internal. Joy is about us about reminding you who you are as a person, um, regardless of what anybody else think. It has mm-hmm. nothing to do with what everybody else is thinking about. So when I think about black boy joy, I think about it as a form of advocacy that while we have all of these things that could be, that is attacking us at this current moment, like we could still have joy. We could still live in these moments. Like that's crazy. That's like, that's like, how do we still laugh? How do we still, like, how are we still doing that? And, and think about black joy. Like it's beautiful that we are all just laughing and, you know, we have, find, we find opportunities to enjoy ourselves and, and safely hug each other during this time and stuff like um you know i i I think i end with thinking about avatar when they say i see you type of thing like i love that part like when they say i see you in the first i see you back it's so cool because to me that's joy when i could just see somebody right now that just brings me so much joy like when i walk past another another black male my new year's resolution was to just acknowledge every black male Oh, Saturday, I was talking about how I got so tired of nodding my head because I saw every black male like, around and stuff like that. But I just wanted them to know that I see you. You know what I mean? Your, your light just shines right now. And that's, that's what I want to happen um, um, in this movement. As we continue to go forward, we got to fight, but we could also continue to show our joy. I say unapologetically. Other folks' opinions of me and... Um, it's not my business, <laughs> like I would say, it's not my business. And I think that like, um, when you can stand in the face of other people's disappointments, expectations, whether they're lowered or, or real, and, and be confident in who you are and who you are, like that's liberating and that's joy within itself. So I live unapologetically free regardless of what anybody thinks of me, including if it's a systemic racist, I'm going to push, push on you. Like that's, that's just how I'm made. That's what my ancestors said. They have carved that pathway for me and I will not wait my liberation on someone else's opinions. It's just, I, I, I find a lot of joy in that. And so, you know, I, and I try and create that space for each and every person to just be a full human being and live in that humanity and realize and recognize that like, um, you know, you're going to make mistakes and, and life goes on. I love Listen. that. Listen, Tiana was the person that like, when I met her, I saw her, I was like, who is that? Like, she just had this radiance, like, going across the stage. You know how she always wear, like, her pattern dresses or pants and stuff with heels on, afro or natural. <laughs> it's like, all right. <laughs> it's so beautiful. It is. And I learned from you. So thank you so much. 
Hey, can you go make me cry? <laughs> Jasmine, how do you hold on to your joy in this moment? Gratitude. I wake up every morning. I have to, like, there's so much going on in the world, and I am just, like, thankful for my help, for my family, for the, their help. I'm grateful to be in a position to serve a Black community and to lead my staff to creating an equitable, like, culturally responsive, anti-Black community for our students so that they can be the joyful children um, that I know we all like want them to be and be whatever their parents want them to be as well. So gratitude is what keeps me centered and joyful. I just want to thank you. I feel like I've been in the living room yeah. in my house and I've just been chatting with my friends around like the work. People have been asking me for weeks now texts, phone calls, how are you doing, Antonio? How are you really doing? And I must say that I'm, I'm devastated on one hand, dealing with a broken heart. It's not easy watching black men die as they call, from, call for their moms or leave the graveside and they're in the hands of what should be public servants and they lose their life or that Breonna Taylor's killers are still free while her life was stolen. Being in this body often means that it feels like a fleeting existence trying to hold on to the very humanity that your creator endowed you with. But every time that I am confronted with my existence or the impossible, I tell myself, rise. I still choose to rise. I, sh I still choose to believe. Because I realize this, and it's something that my grandmother said, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. So the world can't take it away. Core members, Teach for America staff, I'll leave you with this. Changed people, change people that it's not about just looking on the periphery or next to you or calling out the other folks because it's easy to call people out. The real change happens when you actually have to look at your own self and say, am I talking about the work or am I doing the work? And then step into a moment of truth and honesty and realization to say, the most expensive fight that we're all, we're all gonna have is not just the cost for our collective freedom, but for our individual freedom. That me getting free enables other people to get free and that that work for me is not exempt. And so what I'm calling us all into is perhaps the moment of real change. What have you done to be free lately? And what can you do tomorrow to ensure that the freedom of your brothers and your sisters are free as well. When we do this, we understand that it's not Teach for America that does the changing because we're an imperfect entity, but it's actually the decisions of the people who actually make up the fabric of this movement, of this vocation of stepping into the fallow ground of a classroom for change that we all can say, one day we will get there. I'll leave you with this quote. We've been uneasy. If you hear the dogs, keep going. If you see the torches in the woods, keep going. Don't ever stop, keep going. If you want a taste of freedom, just keep going. Ain't nobody said nothing about easy. The wise words. Harriet tell me. Thank you for joining us. Freedom, freedom.